share. Okay, yeah. So just delighted you're here today. And on this uh, workshop, we're doing an interactive lecturing online. I'm going to start from the beginning by saying that there are going to be a lot of little technical glitches along the way. Almost everything that I am using today for this workshop, I'm using for the first time. But I am A-OK -okay with this because you will also be using it for the first time. So I think that seeing um, uh, little mistakes, little glitches will just help you in your own classes as, as you move through and we can kind of problem solve. So I'm telling you that I'm entering this without any, any fear uh, of, of using these things and we'll see how it goes. I also want to say that I think it's, we're at the point where most people are through the, the crisis mode of how do I get on Brightspace and how do I get on Zoom? So now we're really thinking about how can we best engage our students and work with our students. So I'm thrilled you're here today. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else, Jay or Janice, I need to say in terms of opening? Uh, do keep your microphones off um, unless you are, or keep yourself muted unless you want to talk. Um, feel free to chime in and ask questions. You can also post anything in the chat uh, Bart Everson is the voice of the chat today, and so he will be monitoring what's in the chat, and if he needs to stop me and um, tell me something is there that I need to know about, he will do that. It's a great thing to do with your students as well in your classes. Appoint someone to be the voice of the chat that day so that you can, um, you can say, hey, if stuff comes up in the chat that I don't notice, um, it's a great way to engage them in class. So thank you, Bart, for doing that. I'm okay. The workshop Let's get is being recorded as well. And the workshop's being recorded as well. You should have had to acknowledge that when you logged in. So thank you. Workshop's being recorded. And so by being here, you're giving consent. Um, okay. And you will be, this is participatory workshop, as you're going to see, because it's about interactive lecturing. Um, so uh, I just want to start with the um, workshop objectives here. Um, what I want to do in the time we have together today is I want to present the case for interactive lecturing and why you would want to do this. Uh, well, we are disrupted. I think you should do it when you're face to face as well. But, uh, it's a little easier that way. I want to present some tips for getting started with interactive lecturing online. I'm first going to talk about when we're live lecturing. So when we're actually in synchronous classes on Zoom or on Brightspace virtual classroom, lecturing to our students during class time. That's kind of the live lecturing. But I'm also going to talk about how to do it with recorded lectures in case you're planning on recording any of them for students. And we are going to have time to actually share ideas with each other. So that's where we're headed. Um, so uh, I wanted to start with this. I think you'll find my test results are a pretty good indication of your abilities as a teacher. We all know that we we all know that we have to meet students halfway. Students have to do the work, um, but we also know that our abilities to teach them are really important in their classroom experiences. And so that's why we're here today working on this. Um, so this is from the American Association for Higher Education. And if you've ever been to CAT workshops, I often present this, right? I often start workshops with this because this is uh, just uh, looking at this principles of, uh, a committee and task force was put together to look at principles for good undergraduate teaching. And these were the seven principles they came up with. Encourages student faculty contact, encourages cooperation among students, encourages active learning, gives prompt feedback, emphasizes time on task, communicates high expectations, and respects diverse talents and ways of learning. Um, so these are the kind of principles that should guide any of the teaching um, that we do in the classroom. So I've got a question for you. And we're going to use a Zoom poll for this. Um, so the question's going to be, which of the following do you think is most important in remote teaching? If those are, these are the principles for face-to-face -face teaching, which do you think are the most important in remote teaching? Okay. So here we go. So 77% of, of us said encourage a student faculty contact, 31% encourage corpor uh, cooperation among students. I'm not going to read this to you. You can see that the highest was encourage student faculty contact, second highest encourage active learning, third highest giving prompt feedback, and then it kind of falls off from there. Thank you. You'll close it now, Jay. Thank you. Okay, 
So that's a, a Zoom poll, and that's a feature that if you want to learn more about, we can uh, talk about how to do that, but it's a feature that we have within all of our Zoom accounts. You can activate it where you can make polls, and it's very easy and very menu-driven. So if you're lecturing to a large class, you can do a poll like that within, within Zoom, if you're, if you're using Zoom and not Brightspace Virtual Classroom. Um, so let's see. So what is the what is what are the important principles? Uh, the answer is every single one of them plus one. And so this came out from the um, Interactive Distance Education Alliance. They've done a lot of research and again looked at this and found out that all seven principles of undergraduate teaching are just as important on online teaching as they are in the classroom. And then they also added a principle eight, which is course quality. Um, and this is kind of uh, monitoring the course. But you can, now again, I'm acknowledging that what we are doing is not um, well thought out and, and uh, you know, lots of time to prepare online teaching. We are doing remote teaching in an emergency. I get that. But I do want us to kind of pay attention to each one of these points as we go through this last, last month with our students. Um, so student faculty contact is absolutely important. You've got to have clear communication with your student, students and keep in touch with them. Active learning is still gonna be important. Acting like, okay, well now they can just be sit there and be passive learners. Uh, James Lane calls us brains on sticks. We students are not brains on sticks, right? They're, they're people, we need to engage them in the learning. Uh, as far as uh, feedback, being real clear in terms of deadlines, uh, give them, um, you know, give them a lot of feedback on what they're doing as they go along. Uh, cooperation around student, among students, we're going to talk about ways to do this with breakout rooms, um, setting high expectations, okay, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that. So all of them are still very important. So this leads to uh, the idea of interactive lecturing. Just like you can put students to sleep in the classroom, you can also put them to sleep online and even more so because a lot of students are especially if we're not making them turn on their videos or not you know not requiring them to um they are in comfortable chairs or they are in their beds a lot of my students i know uh the bed their bedroom is their quiet space where they're doing their classes and a lot of them have three or four classes in a row so imagine that, that they are sitting there on their bed hour after hour you know, especially in these long Tuesday, Thursday classes. So um, we need to be engaging. If we are just lecturing to them the whole time, it's like watching boring TV all day. Not that it's boring to us, but you know, it could be to them. So this is when interactive lecturing plays a role. And interactive lectures are lectures in which instructors incorporate engagement triggers. And I, I wanted to, I really want to emphasize that word so we can use it consistently the rest of the workshop and as we're talking to each other. Engagement triggers. So it's just um, little points in the lecture where you put uh, activities or um, opportunities for engagement. So you just break up the lecture just a few times per class and have students participate in something, even if it's just like a quick poll like that, right? A quick poll like that, like we just did with the sample Zoom poll, then you can look and you can say, okay, three of you have not participated, so come and participate, and it just re-engages them in the class. It's an engagement trigger or an engagement point. Um, and then this activity should allow you to work directly with the material. Okay, that's what interactive lecturing is, incorporating engagement triggers. We can do this all the time in our face-to-face -face classes because we can see when we're kind of losing our audience, right? And so we can throw out a question and get the, you know, kind of get the energy up. But in remote teaching, it's a little bit more difficult. So um, let's talk about interactive uh, lecture techniques, low tech, and then we'll talk about it with tech. So one of my favorite ones, and again, if you've ever gone to Cat Workshop with me, you know it's one of my favorite ones, is a think, pair, share, right? I, and you also know I think it's a student, stupid name, but I did not name it. Uh, but this is when you give students a prompt, you allow them to think about it or write about it, and then they pair up and exchange ideas with a partner. It is a fantastic, fantastic technique. For one thing, it, it slows us down a bit, okay, because we're just often you know, giving students this material and not allowing them to think in class. Um, it also allows them to, um, to actually, you know, reflect on it in their own words, 
as they're getting this new material. And then it's, it's a bit of collaborative learning because they can pair up and exchange ideas. You can do a think pair share with, with um, anything. You can put a multiple choice question on your slide and say, hey, um, what's the answer to this? Think about what the answer is. And then um, uh, pair up and exchange, you know, pair up and be sure you got the same thing. Pair up and exchange. You can do a prompt, a writing prompt, a um, thought question, a come up with your own example question. Like you can do it with anything, think, pair, share. <clears throat> I actually, one of my favorite uses of think, pair, share is when I have gone through some complex material and then I ask the students, okay, what questions do you have? And nobody has any questions, right? Nobody, crickets. Then I'll say, okay, well, everybody think of one question and then pair up with your partner and compare questions. And then I say, okay, what questions do we have? And then all of a sudden there'll be a lot of really good questions. Okay, so think, pair, share, really nice technique. So how do so, we do uh, this on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I just wanted to jump in and mention that in the chat we have a uh, bit of a discussion emerging about students turning on their cameras or rather not turning on their cameras, refusing to turn on their cameras, not wanting to in different, um, but actually a number of, of comments along those lines um, saying that uh, when they do turn their cameras on, they're, they're not always pointed at them. Um, and, you know, the, the protocol, of should we you know, require them or, or, or not and so forth. Thank you. Thanks, Bart. Um, yeah, so I think that um, what I've been seeing emerge on a lot of the faculty development listservs is um, a consensus of not requiring students to turn on their cameras. There might be cases where they don't want to really share their home life with you. There might be cases where they are having to watch nieces or nephews or siblings, might have them in the room with you, whereas so this would be a distraction to their learning. You really want to, in this emergency remote teaching uh, situation, you want to allow the students to have the most um, comfortable and uh, equitable learning environment you can. What I have done is I've said to my students, if you at all comfortable, please turn on your videos because I need to see your faces. I miss you. And most of them do. Some of them will blink. You know, some of them will kind of come in and out during the class period. Um, uh, and then I and then I call on students uh, with not cold call on difficult material, but after I've presented a bit of material, I would say, so uh, Ralph, explain to me in your own words, give me an example of a think pair share or something like that. So I'm making sure that everybody's kind of staying engaged that way. I do call on them and I do call them randomly, uh, but some of them I understand they don't want to turn their cameras on. I also promised them that I would not dress up for class. I said, I know you are, I've got three students from California and my class starts at 925. And so that's it's 725 for them and they have an eight o'clock class. So they start class at 6 a.m. It's one of the consequences of synchronized teaching, right? They have class at 6 a.m. and then they're coming to mine. And I just said, I promise I won't dress up for you. So um, we've kind of gotten through that, but too long an answer. But bottom line is I think, um, I think especially in this situation, if you were teaching this online class from the beginning and you wanted cameras on, you would say that on day one in the syllabus, students would know, boom, done. But since this is a remote situation, I think the better, the more flexible we can be with them, the better. Does anybody else, before we move on, because I do want to get to our stuff, but does anybody else want to speak on that, open up their microphone and speak on that? Or did that cover it, Bart, at least? <clears throat> I, um, I agree. In fact, I was just discussing this with my mother yesterday because she was like, well, make them, make them put their cameras on. I'm like, you know, they're in, Lord knows, I mean, <laughs> I get to choose where, what my view is, but, you know, we have a big enough house. So I, I really am trying to respect their privacy in these odd times. But especially in freshman seminar, it is just, yeah, I had a guest speaker today from Covenant House, and I'm sure he was wondering, like, why am I speaking to a bunch of black squares? Um, it's just, it's really hard to feel, and I, maybe they, and that's the other thing I wonder is just because me at the age of 50 feels weird about this, they, they might not feel the same way um, given the, the generation gap. I don't know. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Oh, we're, they, we're actually getting in a little bit about stuff that Jay and I are doing a workshop next week about engaging students. 
and we're going to, so this is good feedback to get for that, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but interactive lecturing will engage them just also because you're forcing them to kind of do something. So you know the little black boxes are doing something, right? Um, you can also really say, hey, did everybody get that? Just put yes in the chat or something like that, just so that you know they're there. Just weird. It's the whole thing. This whole thing's weird. Okay. Um, but some online hey, options. Yes? Oh, I just wanted to note that Ray uh, was asking if the, the, the pair part takes place over chat. Here we go. Perfect. Thank you, Ray Lane. Let's move forward. So here are some online options. We're going to start just with the think pair share. Here are some online options for doing that. Um, one thing is you can put your answers in the chat. Okay, and we're going to talk about uh, the pair and that part in a minute, Ray, I promise. But here are ways that you can um, do interactive lecturing just like you would throw out a question, you can throw it out and say, put your answers in the chat. We're going to practice that in a moment. You can use something like Poll Everywhere. Let me show you this. Uh, Kahoot uh, is another, another example um, that you could use. You can use breakout groups. We're going to do that in this workshop. You're actually going to be participants in breakout groups. Jay's going to help me with that, so I'm giving you the heads up since I'm not the host. Uh, we can do it uh, you know, randomly. All right. Uh, and then we can do polling in Zoom. Right, so that we've already we've already um, done. We've seen polling and Zoom. These are ways to be interactive in your lecturing. So let's go through some more. Uh, let's try it. Um, what do you think of? I want you to think of a couple of keywords. But what do you think of when you think of remote teaching? And what I would like you to do is get your phones out, and you're going to text Elizabeth Ham six eight two. 37607 to join. I am using poll everywhere. So you're going to do Elizabeth Ham 682 uh, to join and then you're going to text your response. What do you think of when I say remote teaching? Ah, oh, there we go. Here they come. So keep them coming now. So what I set up in poll everywhere is I set up a word cloud and I, so you get all different kinds of questions. One question is multiple choice. One question is, you know, you can uh, short answer. One question is, you know, there's a bunch of different questions you can use and pull it anywhere. Again, we would be happy to do some workshops on how to use this tool, but I just picked the, um, I just picked the word cloud option so that we could see what this looks like. So again, imagine I had just had a guest, guest speaker right come in and then you could say to everybody okay keyword what's the what was the take home point from this guest speaker what did you get from this guest speaker or from this reading or this passage uh, i know we've got some literature people here so from this passage we just read what would be your what would be the key thing and then you can come kind of see this on the fly <clears throat> excuse me uh, elizabeth is this yes, something Justin. that is is this free for the students to use in the yep. fact? Yep. I just went to polleverywhere.com. Honestly, I, I did this. This is the first time I've ever done this. Y'all, so y'all keep typing in. It's great. Uh, I, I just went to polleverywhere.com. It's just made an account, did this, um, and then I just embedded the link in my uh, slides. Is there a maximum number of students? Like, is that it? Yeah. With, with the free account, yeah, with the free account, I think you're limited to 40 responses to any given poll. Um, and then it's the kind of thing where you can buy a, a pro account or whatever and, and have more, more, uh, more options. So Baha, I'll get right to you. So Justin, that might be yeah, something actually, you want to mention yeah. to uh, Dean yeah. Kennedy. Sorry, go ahead, Baha. Yeah, actually, I am using poll everywhere for a long time. It, there is a limitation of number but i mean it, it doesn't affect our our work usually uh i didn't face any um i mean any, any obstacles we we use it and the students like it once they uh, be family then it is really enjoyable okay thank you Thank you. A uh, uh, pharmacy uh, Baha is, is, you know, he, this is our newest colleague with us on this call on this workshop. Uh, so our pharmacy classes are, are big, are large. So that's why we always have to kind of think about 
think about that. But Justin, I think asking uh, Christy or Dean Kennedy about maybe we, purchasing it. We have Top Hat. We they pharmacy uses Top Hat. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So same thing. And you could also do it within Zoom Zoom polling as well. I just wanted you to see a different feature. Okay. I'm going to now exit. Out. So so here we go. Uh, that's interesting though. That the biggest thing that came out was asynchronous, and ours is uh, not asynchronous. <laughs> ours is required not to be asynchronous. So that's kind of interesting. Challenging pajamas, YouTube. I love it. I don't know what just didn't. Okay. <laughs> Yikes. Go. Okay. So I just wanted to show that as an example of poll everywhere. And again, let's come back to the main point is we are trying to put engagement triggers into our lectures. So you can put an engagement trigger by using a poll within Zoom. You can do an engagement trigger with using something else like poll everywhere, Kahoot, you know, whatever you are comfortable with. It just stops the students just from listening to you talk and allows them to do something. Okay, and then you can see where they are. It's also really good formative assessment, right? You can see, oh, here's some confusion that I need to clear up. Um, okay, so now we're going to do breakout groups. Okay, breakout groups is a function within Zoom. Hey, if everybody in, in the chat would put, if they, for Bart, uh, if, if would you put if you're using Zoom or if you're using virtual Brightspace? just so we'll know the balance. And then Bart, if you will let me know how many, about how many of each. Are you using Zoom or using virtual <laughs> prices? If you'll put that in the chat, I'd Amy appreciate says, it. I, Amy says you should do a poll. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I'll let you know, I did want, so we had a question if the poll was embedded in the PowerPoint or was it embedded somehow in the Zoom meeting? This poll right here? No. This poll right here? Correct, your poll everywhere. This I just put as a hyperlink so that when I clicked on it, it took me straight to it. So I just, um, so it takes me out. So you can see, look at my tab. It took me out of Google Slides. I was using Google Slides and it took me to a uh, poll everywhere, okay? And I just embedded it as a hyperlink for ease of this presentation. All right, and the results are in. The overwhelming answer is zero. Okay, uh, how many, Bright, virtual bright spaces do we have? I saw two, uh, okay. for, one for class meetings and one for office hours. Okay, so for those of you using virtual bright space, this, this, uh, there would be something different, uh, be a different structure for you. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about breakout rooms in Zoom right now, we're gonna do this. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do, we're actually going to put you in breakout rooms. Now what breakout rooms are is it's the online equivalent of getting into small groups. Just like you might say, okay, here's the question I want you to deal with. Um, oops. Here's the question I want you to deal with in a small group. Get in small, small groups in it and talk about it. This is what we're gonna do. What I'm gonna do, what Jay's gonna do, <laughs> do is um, in okay. small groups, um, I would like you for five minutes to talk about the ways you've made your lectures interactive. And that means how have you made your, um, how, what, what uh, engagement triggers have you typically included? You can talk about this in the face-to-face -face context. How have you, you know, how do you use engagement triggers when it comes face-to-face? -face? Because then we'll come back and talk about how to do that online, okay? So, I'm gonna, so we're gonna put you into small groups. Uh, in breakout rooms, Zoom calls those breakout mm -hmm. rooms. Um, I would like each of the small groups to appoint a timekeeper because I'm actually going to set um, we're going to set a timer for the five minutes. And whoever in your group find out who is furthest away from campus right now, who is the most distant from campus, and that person is going to be assigned a spokesperson. So when we get back together, they're going to be the one that will speak for your group. Okay, every, does everybody understand the task? If so, give me the thumbs up. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we will, if, if you want to, uh, we'll, we'll set up, now that we're demonstrating some of these, we will set up times where you, uh, workshops where we will actually um, work through and show you how to do these breakout rooms. 
Uh, Jay, before we move out of the breakout rooms, is there anything you wanted to say, either you or Janice? Did you want to say anything? We did have a question about breakout rooms, if they can be assigned, uh, or if they have to be assigned by the meeting host or students can self-select. Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit as people were coming back. Um, and I'll just say real quickly, uh, Zoom can do it automatically. It can just randomize into whatever number of groups you want it to do, um, which is what I did. Or you can go through and manually say, create a room and put these students in it, create a room and put these students in it. Obviously, that's a little hard to do if you're actually teaching. And then I was saying you can set them up ahead of time, but you have to have the student's email address that's connected to their Zoom account. So they have to have a Zoom account and you have to have the email address. So unless all of our students sign up for their Zoom account through Xavier's account, which they can do, but most of them have not done, um, that's not gonna work very well. Okay, I don't understand. If, if they haven't signed up, how are, we, how are they coming to our meetings? Uh, you can anybody, log into a Zoom meeting without having an account. When, so when you send, okay. I'm sorry, Ralph, when you send that link out, like you could send that link out to your grandkids and have a little Zoom meeting with them. Okay. Like when you send the link out, that's inviting to your meeting. They don't have to have an account. Yeah. Um, we will talk, we will, yeah. like I said, do more training about uh, breakout groups, but I think that they are, uh, as far as like self-selecting and getting students to do that, you would have to know that to then place them in those rooms. I think right now to kind of get through these next few weeks, just using it at the most basic level until we're comfortable with it is the best. But it's a great way to do a think pair share, right? So this is back to the <laughs> question about how to do that. You can give them the information, give them a chance to think about it, and then break them out to groups and then come back, what questions do you have? So the tools will let you help do that. And then your job is to make meaningful tasks, like this task here, make a meaningful task for the class. Bart, were you gonna say something? It's been a, uh, Jay answered already. Okay, okay. If you don't mind, I know we were going to have spokespeople, but I'm also looking at the time, and we've got a little, a little um, more to get through. Um, so we're not going to have everybody report out. So maybe let's just do one breakout group. Want to just do a quick summary of what you talked about? <laughs> I am not shy to call on you. Would you want me? Let's see. Uh, um, who would like to go? <laughs> Ray, would you like to go? Ray, Ray uh, Lang, unmute yourself and just real quickly tell us what your group talked about. Yes. There it is. Yeah, um, sure. I have the same problem uh, this morning with my class. Uh, nobody wanted to respond. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, Monique has is, is, uh, mastered some of these tools already. Uh, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm still missing the the face to face part because uh, mm -hmm. I'm demoing. I, I'm doing the same thing I do in the class. I'm just sharing my screen out. What I what I'm not able to do is um, circulate around and, and troubleshoot. Yeah, uh, they solve problems, but. Um, I see there's a way to designate a host in virtual classroom. And something I do in the, in the real classroom is I bring people to the front and say, okay, you solve this because they're, they're much more likely to offer suggestions when it's another student at the front of the room mm -hmm. instead of me at the console. They, they know I know the answers, so they, they mm -hmm. climb up. But if it's another student up there, they'll, they'll offer more suggestions. So I want to try and, and, um, figure out how to use that, maybe designate, you know, a host so that someone else could share their screen and, and do the equivalent of, of uh, bringing someone to the board to try and get more, more engagement. That's what Great. I, that's what my plan anyway. Great. Thank you. I also right. just modeled what I've been doing. Oh, Jay, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. I just wanted to say real quickly, Ray, you don't need to designate the student as a host. Um, everybody should be able to share their screen. Um, as a participant. So. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, good. They have this, they have this, thank you, Jay. They have the same share screen button that down at the bottom that we have. And oh, they, right. I've had them share screen, I've had them share their screens mm -hmm. a zillion times. Yep. And it works really easy. They know how to do it. Mm -hmm. they the do other thing, do it, right? 
<laughs> the other thing that I would like to uh, say before we move on from breakout groups is um, one thing you might have noticed when you have that toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen on breakout rooms, one of the, quest one of the options is ask a question. And so if your students are in the group, they can click on that and you will get a little pop-up that will say uh, um, group three has a question. And you can go into that group and answer the question. You can also just pop in on groups, just see how you're doing. You saw that Jay sent us a, a tech uh, or chat in the middle. It said, you know, your time's almost up. So you can like check in halfway through, you're halfway through, how's it going? Let me know if you have questions. Um, so there's a lot you can do with group or breakout rooms, Ray, that is like floating around because I float around the room a lot too. I do too, but also too, you can automatically set the time for you to come back into the main group. Yep. It'll do it for you automatically. Yep, exactly. Thank you, Ron. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, it's so nice seeing you guys. Oh, so good seeing your faces. I miss you. I miss you. Okay, let's keep let's keep going. Uh, keep an eye on the time here. Let's keep going. Um, so there are a couple other interactive lecture techniques besides think, peer, share. I'm just going to mention these and just fly through them. I'm just say, saying that just giving students a question and then putting them in rooms over and over is not the only thing you have to do. You can do something that's called directive paraphrasing, and this is a lot of fun. This is when students have to paraphrase concepts for a specific audience. And Justin, if I am not mistaken, Justin, our colleague from um, a PA program, did this with his students recently by having them make videos for their grandparents where they're explaining some concept and their audience is the grandparents. But directed paraphrasing, if you have a really tough concept and then you say now, you have to describe it to a seven-year-old using only words a seven-year-old understand. You can have them then pretend, in, in, again, in a group, one person's a seven-year-old, the other one's the explainer, then you can swap and it's, it's just a neat little technique. You can have them do application cards, and this is where students generate real world applications to what you just did. So you just presented this theory. So, so what? Why, what's one application you can use for this, this theory or this principle? You can also do uh, background knowledge probes. This is a real nice thing to do with Poll Anywhere or the Zoom polling feature. Before you start a section on a new chemical, uh, chemical compound, you can see I'm talking out of my link here. Um, you can ask them, how many of you have used this product before? And then maybe people have, and you can say, okay, that product has this chemical in it. I don't know, something like that, a background knowledge probe. How many of you have heard of this before? And then just get them to see, and just that, again, it's an engagement trigger. Let's remember what we're doing here. We're just doing engagement triggers throughout our lecturing. Anything you can just throw in there, have you even heard of this before, makes them turn back into you and do something, and so you have their attention for a moment. Okay, and that's what we're shooting for here. Um, okay, so, so far we've talked about doing this in real life lectures, like live synchronous, I should say, <laughs> real life lectures. Synchronous lectures online using like Zoom or virtual classroom. So what about if, I, if you are recording lectures and you're having students do this? You would do the same thing, only it would be individual work as opposed to collaborative work. But you would do the same thing um, where you think about engagement triggers. And the ways I've seen this done best are where the person lecturing says, okay, I want you to stop the video here and write down an example of what you just learned. Or I want you to stop the video here and write a reflection on this, this piece of work we're discussing. Or I want you to stop the video here and do this. Um, a better practice is then to make sure there's some follow-up on that. So stop the video here and write a reflection on the, on the piece we're just discussing and post it in the Brightspace discussion topic titled uh, reflection on reading, you know, or depending on your class size, stop the video here and uh, write down a real life application of this and email it to me. That's just a more simple way. Using it, I would not recommend having students email you individual work, it would get overwhelming. I'm just saying, uh, depending on your class size, you could do something like that to be more simple. But you know, something where there's some accountability. 
Um, there are other high-tech tools we could talk about in terms of embedding quiz features into a recorded slide. So if you're recording your slides, you can actually embed quiz features in there. That's a little more advanced than we're going to get into today. But you still, if you're doing this, still think about engagement triggers. Still think about engagement triggers for your students as you go, as you go throughout this. Um, So getting started with interactive lecturing. Um, one thing is if you don't like a technique, if you don't like think pair share, if you don't like directed paraphrasing, if you don't like something about this, don't use it. Students can smell inauthenticity a mile away. If it doesn't work for you, and it could, if you don't like it, then don't even try to fake it, right? But think about your own authentic engage, engagement triggers. I think everybody could agree that that, that um, idea is important. So um, think about um, what the ways to engage within your discipline, within your course, and within your teaching style and your course objectives. How can you put triggers in and then use those. Um, start small if you've never done this before. Don't try to do four brand new things in one workshop. You know, pick uh, one of the new things you want to do, pick one tool and use it for that day, and then add tools to your toolbox each time. Um, socialize students, just like at the beginning of this workshop, I said, you know, there are going to be mistakes because I'm doing these for the new first time, but so are you doing this for the first time. So tell students, I'm going to be trying to be more, I'm going to be trying to engage you throughout the lecture, and so I'm going to be using these new tools, let me know how they work. You know, and make them partners in their learning. Um, allow for a little more time than you think, like just like I thought we were going to have a chance to get back and um, report out. Everybody could report out. Obviously, that didn't happen because we have more questions along the way. So, you know, always allow for a little more time than you think. And then also make sure to close the loop. If you get students doing this and they come back and there, is mis there are misconceptions or there is confusion, don't just keep plowing through to make sure you get through all you know, all the material, be sure that you clear up any misconceptions and respond to misunderstandings, okay? Um, so, last thing we're gonna do is a simple technique of put your answer in the chat. So if all else, if you don't like any of these other tools or you're just not ready to dive in with them right now, then what you can do is you can simply use the chat. So what I would like you to do is let's, let's um, model this now. And I would like you to summarize the theme of this workshop in one word. And I would like you to do it, I think people are already doing it. I was going to say do it privately to Bart so we wouldn't see each other's answers, but that's okay. You're faculty, you won't, just, you won't copy each other's answers. Okay, so. Um, so you're putting it in the chat. Bart, are you seeing stuff in the chat? Yes, I'm getting some private answers and some are, are not so private. Okay, would you want to just read some out for me? Sure. Uh, we got you don't useful. have to tell me who they are, just, just the words. Yes, useful, engagement, 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 hallelujah, <laughs> helpful, eye-opening, interactive teaching, and awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, that's called a word journal, a really great way at the end of a complex, con uh, a complex um, bit of material is you can say summarize that theory in one word and then give me a couple sentences about why you chose that word. It really forces students to see the big picture instead of all the little minutia. It's a great, again, a great thing you can do as a big pair share. Um, so um, that is what we've got. and We've got one minute left. Please keep visiting our hashtag keep teaching Zula resources and you'll see the um, link here. We are adding to those resources every single day. We have got so much on there now. We've also got a link about uh, compassion and humanity in teaching and issues of care. We've got now links to it on, um, on all the kind of freebies that what the publishers are offering in terms of free, free things for students and faculty. Um, so please keep, um, keep visiting it. We're building it every single day. And then also you'll be receiving a evaluation survey shortly after this workshop for the workshop. Uh, 529, any last questions?